Hello. There we go. Fantastic. Right. Hello and welcome to Andrew McCluskey's talk on introducing programming to undergraduate chemists. Thank you. Oh. Alright, okay, this is going to be fun. I'm not used to doing this like a pop star, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so I'm Andrew, um, but first things first. So, this link at the top, this is a totally interactive presentation. You can go on that link and you can click things. And you can, there's literature examples and there's uh, links to notebooks and my binder links and all that. You can go and click on things, it's fun. Or if you can't see it, because I'm funny when I choose colours for things, so if something you can't see, you might not see it better if you go to the link. It's up to you whether you do that or not, it's all there. Uh, so I'm Andrew McCluskey, I am a chemistry PhD student at the University of Bath. I also tutor physical chemistry to first year undergraduate chemists and I uh, am a demonstrator in the undergraduate computational chemistry lab at the Department of Chemistry in Bath. Uh, so I have a lot of different hats on uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we've been doing in Bath to try and bring programming, and in particular Python programming, to the undergraduate chemistry course at Bath. And so this is all part of what's called the Python and Chemistry Project, which I'll tell you something about. Uh, I have social media things, you can follow me, you can email me, I don't really mind. If you follow me on Twitter, it's mostly just me probably arguing with politicians about science policy. So, um, as, as we heard from uh, Spencer's talk earlier on today, he studied chemistry and he didn't know how to program until recently. Chemists aren't typically taught to program. We go through our chemistry degree being taught how to do things like this. We go to get taught to mix our vessels, uh, where are our safety specs and where are our lab coats looking at microscopes and all that. And nowadays more and more people are expecting chemists to do things a bit more like this, where they do CD things and make drugs like the guy out of Breaking Bad. The fact of it is that a lot more, it's a lot more common nowadays for chemists to be doing something like this. And this is actually what I do day to day. I'm a computational chemist. Uh, I use computers to do chemistry basically. And this is happening more and more as uh, chemistry has become more and more an analytical subject and a subject about data science, or data analysis. And so chemists are actually doing more and more data analysis. This is a plot of the percentage of academic chemistry publications that mention the phrase data analysis. So we're now at the case in 2008 where almost 40 or about 40% of all academic chemistry publications from all areas of chemistry, from organic chemistry, physical chemistry, anything, mention some form of data analysis. And they're not just analyzing data, they're doing it in Python. So this is another plot that's the same thing, the percentage of chemistry publications that mention Python. And so now we can see how exponential this curve has got, and we're now in the case that 7% of all chemistry publications are mentioning Python. Now, you're, I'm talking about academic chemistry publications, but people don't go to uni really to become academics. Academic people that are studying to, to, for PhDs and stuff like that like to pretend that they do. They like to pretend that we're training undergraduates to then go on and be uh, academics like ourselves. We're not. We're training them to enter the ind industry. And now if you look at the Royal Society of Chemistry's employability page about chemistry. So the Royal Society of Chemistry is chemistry's learning body. And we see there's this bit of mark right here, IT and technology. And this specifically mentions that in a chemistry, a chemistry undergraduate degree, you will gain experience and understanding of computer software models and processing data, doing this data analysis. And so this all kind of built, so I, I ended up teaching myself to program in my spare time while I was working in industry, well my spare time, I automated half my job. And so it gets, the fact that we're not teaching chemists to program necessarily kind of makes me annoyed. It kind of winds me up and when you speak to senior academics that kind of shrug off the idea of active chemist programming, it makes me feel like this little person. And so, uh, in an effort to address it, uh, to address this problem where we're not training chemists to analyse data efficiently, we're getting them using things like Excel, we started the, chemist, the Python Chemistry Project. And so that was a project that started at the University of Bath Department of Chemistry uh, by Drs Ben Morgan and Fiona Dickinson about two years ago now. This started simply as putting Python into undergraduate lab exercises. So it was two years ago we, we, we got a Python lab, lab exercise. And then over this past year, I've actually taken that and I started using Python as a teaching tool in the, my undergraduate physical chemistry tutorials. We then have also been developing bits of software, bits of teaching software to use in the undergraduate lectures, labs, whatever, they're all based in Python, they're all open source. And then we've also got a web page that overarchs all. And I'm going to tell you all of this is basically what my talks about. I'll talk about this Python chemistry project. So starting off with the labs. 
Originally, what Bath had was Bath had one data analysis lab through your whole undergraduate in chemistry. And you did it in Excel. You were given a, a, a data set, and you were told to use solver to plot some line and then figure out some numbers. Uh, that's now been overhauled. It was taken out two years ago and replaced with a Python data analysis intro introductory lab. Now it's the case we're in our third year of the project and there is two Python labs at each of first and second year of the, the student's undergraduate. So those cover an introductory basics Python lab, then there's an introduction to data analysis lab, and then there's two labs where they actually model, model chemically relevant data using Python. And so the way that we actually do this is this, it's all in a Jupyter notebook. I, I, I assume that everyone's kind of familiar with this sort of thing. So, I'm getting a head shoot. Okay. Yes, I think it'd be worthwhile to just briefly introduce right, cool, that's right. It's interactive, guys. So, <laughs> right, so Jupyter Notebook um, is, is quite, a, it's quite a common thing for myself and as a kind of research chemist, but it allows us to put um, markdown, so textual information, in alongside the code blocks, and it creates, that, uh, uh, it creates it so that students can actually have a self-led exercise. So in, in the way that a traditional laboratory exercise would work is the students would read from a book, they go away and mix their chemicals. Now what the students can do is read from a book and write their code. So it means that this can, this can run as a typical lab would, where they just have a couple of floating demonstrators like myself that go about and go, the student takes up their hand and goes, I've got this big error message, and I go, oh, it's because your two strings are different lengths, or whatever. <coughs> so this is the way that we do it all. It's actually, uh, we're now in the, the position where we're starting to open source all of the labs. So all of the labs will be available on the Python Chemistry or web page. At the moment, you can get the introduction to, introduction to data analysis lab on that web page, and you can, go and you can go and have a look at it. I've actually now got it where I go to traditional academic conferences and talk to people about programming. They're like, oh, but where do I start? And I'm like, well, is your undergraduate chemistry? Like, are you a chemist by training? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, go look at these resources. They're developed by Ben Morgan. It's an academic in Bath. They're worth their salt, go check them out, and they'll, they'll give you the jumping off point that you need to actually use Python in your own work. Uh, we're currently working on a paper for the Journal of Open Source Education, which I'll mention again later on. It's if you're developing teaching tools, uh, programmatic teaching tools, it's a very useful thing to get some sort of accreditation for what you've done or to get people to hear about it, uh, especially in the spheres that I run in, in academic spheres where it's a kind of publisher perish mentality, which is important case. So this is what I, so I'm a demonstrator in the course, and this is what I get from a lot of the students. <laughs> they all, they, they, I will sit there, and I'll come over and I'm like, oh, so how are you finding? They're like, I, I signed up for a chemistry degree. I didn't sign up to do this. I'm meant to be a chemist, not a programmer. Why, why, why are you making me do this? To which my response is always, I have an undergraduate master's degree in chemistry, and I'm now doing a PhD in chemistry, and this is all I do. And then I also remind them, about the employability statistics for people that can code versus people that can't. <laughs> Almost all of them are like, all right, okay, fine, we'll go with it. So this is actually some feedback that we took after the labs. So this is a, 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 just a word cloud of all the words. I, I, the first time I did this, that word useful was like twice as, or like a bit bigger. And I was like, oh, hang on. There's about nine times when I was putting in the data that said not useful. So that includes the negations. This includes the negations there. So the, 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 that is a true useful. So this is, we've got feedback of the students after the labs for both the first and the second year. And the fact that that word useful is pretty big uh, makes me feel quite good about what we can do. So that's looking at the kind of lab stuff. So the next aspect was bringing it into the tutorials. So these are small groups, six people and a, and a PhD student, or six people in an academic tutorial. Um, and I tutor physical chemistry, which is the borderline between chemistry and physics. So it is mathematically intensive. And now the University of Bath is slightly unusual in that it um, will accept people for a chemistry degree if they don't have A-level maths. There's only about five universities in the country that do that, and Bath is one of them. And so that means a lot of the time when you're trying to get physical chemistry concepts across to students, they don't have the mathematical underpinnings to keep up. And this is something I noticed over the past two, uh, the, my first two years of being a tutor. And so I was thinking about ways to improve this. And I liked the Jupyter Notebooks framework where it was quite interactive and the students would be able to see what was happening. And I was like, well, maybe if I bring that in, the fact that programming means that I have to be completely explicit about the math that I'm doing, maybe that can, through some sort of way, help the students. And now, you should know, I'm not trying to teach the students how to code during these tutorials. That is too much work for a tutorial. I am trying to use it as a teaching tool and make it available to them in the future. The other benefit, of course, is that 
by having a Jupyter notebook and after each tutorial I make, a I make one Jupyter notebook for the whole tutorial and put that on a resource called MyBinder which is interactive and the students can go access the resource after the fact, work through the tutorial in their own time, cover that concept that they haven't been familiar with, they haven't felt comfortable with during the tutorial. And that offers the ability of giving the students instantaneous feedback that may not be there during the tutorial. So I've actually got an example which it's always risky business when you're doing uh, like a talk to have like live coding examples, but we'll see how it goes. So um, this is actually a question from our first year physical chemistry tutorial. You don't need to know. You don't need to know the chemistry. The point of it is that you get these numbers and you plot them as a straight line, and the gradient of that straight line is equal to a mass. You can also determine that mass from this chemical formula. That's the two things that you need to know for this. So what we do is this is actually how it. it uh, bring it on in the, in the tutorial. We have obviously we're importing matplotlib and, and packages like curve fit in order to fit our straight line. And then I've got a function of the straight line which returns the gradient. This second cell will actually calculate the mass based on that chemical formula. So that's the mass that we should be getting from the straight line. And so we calculate this and we find that the mass should be 46 grams. This second cell will take all, the, all this experimental data up here and plot it and fit a straight line to it. So you can see here we've fit a straight line. Sorry, I've just realised that this needs to be a six to make a point. So we fit in a straight line and you can see that if you can make it out, it may be a bit fuzzy. So this is the real mass, this is the mass from the, the chemistry, it's 46 grams. But if you fit this straight line, it comes out as 53, 54 grams, which is quite a big deviation. And now all of my students would, before they came to the tutorial, all, all the good ones that cared, before they, did, they came to the tutorial, would work through the question using a pen and paper. They wouldn't draw the graph, because it takes a lot of effort for a student to draw a graph or go and use Excel or whatever. And, they, and I was like, well, what did you get? And they were like, oh, well, it was a bit big, but I think it's just a mistake. I think it's a mistake with the question. And I was like, all right, okay, well, let's plot it. We plot it, and I said, well, what to you looks funny about that curve? And now the teaching point is that once we get to the higher values of density, the model that we're fitting with this straight line falls down and doesn't work anymore. And so all the students went, well, now that you plot it, the line's not straight. Because you can see here the line does actually curve and it's, it's clearly tending towards being a bit more logarithmic or something. And I was like, yeah, that's the point. So what can we do? And they were like, well, let's consider fewer data points. Cool. And so the way that I've actually written the notebook means that we've got this variable data points up here. And so we can change this from 6, which is all the data points, to the value that was suggested in the, in the answers from the academic that set the question, which is 3. So we can consider just those 3 data points and we get a mass of 48.7 grams compared to 46 grams. That's a lot better. That's a lot closer to the value. And I was like, and I was like right, okay, done and dusted question answered. You guys all know what you're doing now. But one student goes, hang on. This data point, that's already below the line. Is the model already collapsing at that density? I was like, I don't know. I've only worked through this based on Gareth's answers. Let's find out. And so I'm actually going to go ahead and change the number of data points we're considering just for the first two. And we plot it again. The line doesn't appear to change that much, but our value actually reduces by almost an entire gram. And we get, much, we get closer again to the real value. And so uh, the point I'm trying to make with this example is just that the fact that we had this available to us in the, in the, in the tutorial environment meant that the students could interact with it, get that instantaneous feedback, and it kind of engaged them a wee bit more. You can see all my tabs I've got. Um, so, I gave you kind of more formalised feedback for the labs. This is my informal feedback from doing the tutorial. So the students did appear anecdotally more engaged. They seemed to enjoy the fact that they could interact with the, with the material through the Jupyter notebook. There was one particular industrious student who would uh, go on to the resource that was available, go on and download the notebook after the tutorial, and work through it again. And then any time they managed to they encounter a problem or didn't understand something, they would modify the notebook such that it reproduced their, their misunderstanding effectively, and would send me that notebook. Um, and for me to be like, all right, okay, well, I'll understand where you're going wrong. In the same way that when we're trying to submit bugs, we have to submit an example of how that bug is treated. That student was doing that same process. And I think that's a win on all parts for me. Okay, so that's labs, that's tutorials. Now we're going to tell you about, about open source tools. And so Bath, uniquely in the country, has undergraduate, undergraduate computational chemistry, 
laboratory exercises from first year. No other university, no other chemistry department does that. And one of the things that we needed was what's called a molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulation engine. Right? So this is time for the actual chemistry. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. So this is all the background you need to know. In chemistry, in computational chemistry, we can use a simulation technique called molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics treats our, we can treat our particles as little balls that bounce off each other. When there's, the density of those little balls is really low, the, uh, we're effectively simulating a gas. And that's what you get here whenever the sparsely dense, the sparsely populated, and they're not interacting much. As you increase the density, the, uh, the not to such an extent that it becomes ordered. So the particles are closer together, but there's no order in the system. You get a liquid, like water. And then if you increase it again, you'll get a solid where things crystallize. So things form an ordered pattern, and they're very close together. And using molecular dynamics, you can simulate these systems at different temperatures. That's all the chemistry you need to know. And so this led to us trying, this led to us developing what's called pilage. So that stands for Python, Leonard Jones. And Leonard Jones is the technique that we use to simulate this. This is a completely open source Python library that's aimed to engage undergraduate chemistry and also I've used it in graduate courses as well, students with this atomistic simulation techniques. It's under an MIT license, it's open source, it's all on GitHub. And we actually published in this journal of open source education uh, about it, so you can go and if you're really interested, you can read the paper, there's a DOI and everything. And one of the cool things was I presented this, uh, I took a poster to an like, uh, internal Bath HPC symposium because I hadn't done any real HPC work over the past year, so I was like, I'll show people this. Uh, and a, a postdoc, a postdoctoral research associate came up to me from the physics department, he was like, oh, well done, you've embarrassed the physics department. <laughs> and I was like, why? He was like, because we should have done this first. <laughs> so he came over and I, I talked to the code and stuff like that, he's like, okay, this looks cool. So he forked the code on GitHub and then took my code base and wrote Pising, which is a, a Python Ising model, which is something that's very common in physics undergraduates. And so he was actually able to just, it took him like a day's work to implement an Ising model within the same code base. And so that was quite a cool result. So I'm going to show you, this, this is the logo for Pilage, which I'm really proud of, uh, because this looks like an L, but it's actually a Leonard Jones function. <laughs> I know this means nothing to a lot of people, but it means something to me, I'm really cheesing with it. Right. So I can show you an example of Pilage. So Pilage, as it's a Python module, we import it. And now this is scary to chemists, but this is just a molecular dynamics algorithm. And this is actually something that we're now teaching in the undergraduate lab, in the third year undergraduate lab, where we're making use of this code. So the students are able to build up a molecular dynamics algorithm during the lab. So we're going to define this function that is an algorithm, and then we can run the simulation. And so now we can see our little particles bouncing about, bouncing off each other. And now from those pictures I showed you earlier on, those pictures I showed you earlier on, can someone tell me what this is? Is that a solid liquid or a gas? Gas. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, it's a liquid, it's a, between a gas and a liquid. Do you want to see, a, I'll get you a, full, a real gas. When the particles, because there the particles are interacting quite a lot. Here, in, there's maths that you can do to show it. Here we've got something that's a bit more, a bit more gaseous. And then we can go to a really high density and push our particles really close together. And we can simulate that solid. But you see the particles are still moving about because this is all being done at room temperature. This is effectively at room temperature of these simulations. And then because this is all a Python module, it's all it's, it's basically everything gets dumped into one class. So at the end of it, the students can take the information and they can plot it. So for example, this is a plot of the pressure with respect to the simulation text out. So you see the pressure starts really low, really high, when the system is not well equilibrated, and then over time it equilibrates, and you can see that it's going through equilibration. Eventually this will become really, really steady. Um, cool. So, if you are keen, you can go and try this out. Now, it runs on a MyBinder, which is, a, as far as I can tell, GitHub resource. So it's pretty slow, but you can also download it. It's on PEP. You can. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of examples on GitHub. You can go and play with it. This is just the, these are examples of stuff. So you can also do like the DAP. So you can also do Monte Carlo with it if you're interested. So the last thing I'm going to say is we have the web pages. The web pages are basically a way for us to advertise what we do. That's what it started out as. But since then, I started doing some blogs about basic Python skills, trying to put them in chemical context. So there's things like functions, where I've got a function that does um, an ideal gas equation, which is a, a, a common in first year undergraduate chemistry. 
And we've also started putting on information about applications of chemistry and uh, applications of Python and chemical research. So at the moment I'm actually writing a publication that all of the data analysis is done reproducibly using Python. So my plan once I publish that is to put a blog up on the Python chemistry webpage that shows people that this paper is entirely written in Python for all, for all intents and purposes. This is what it looks like. I'm uh, very proud of that using Jekyll that time. And now I just need to acknowledge people who uh, let me come here. So Ben, if you want to make the Python chemistry webpage. Ian is the postdoc in physics who made Pising. James Grant is the research software engineer at the University of Bath, who's helped a lot in my life, basically. And then Karen and Steve are my actual, because day to day I'm a research PhD student. They are the people who make sure I get paid and look after me and let me go on this adventure where I started doing all this. And then PyCon helped me out because I had to, well, they paid for my train to come here today. So thank you to PyCon. And uh, so Tanya Allard, who is somewhere in the conference, but I shamelessly stole her, sl her slide template for reveal. Um, and so, but then I made, it, I made it better in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> then thank you guys. If you have any questions, I'm um, happy to answer them. And then all of my talks into the picture of my dog, because she's bloody beautiful. So let's see. Thank you. So this is all uh, teaching with undergrads. Like, have you tried doing like Python outreach with your fellow postgrads? Yes. So, so James Grant, uh, who's our RRC, uh, I used to share an office with him, so I'm with him. Me, uh, well, he ran a like a course which was introduction to programming. So we did a week of Bash, a uh, week of Advanced Bash, Python, Advanced Python, and Git, and uh, and basically. It was for the whole university, for students, staff, whoever wanted to come. But uh, we didn't have many people sign up until I sent it round to the chemistry department. It was like, this might be useful for people. So we then ended up overbooked completely. Um, and there was a huge amount of demand for it. Uh, the people that used it seemed to enjoy it. And also, um, I've now got a bunch of my mates that want me to do coding for them. And I'm like, no, no, you do it. That was the point of it. <laughs> Uh, what do you wish you had from a technical perspective, knowledge-wise or tooling-wise? What what would make your life easier or better? So, the reason. So, at the moment, the thing I'm uh, for example, with Pilot. So, Pilot was my baby over the past year, and uh, trying to get people to use it is a bit of a technical difficulty because the people that I want to be using it don't necessarily have the technical skills to use it, so they don't understand what PIP is. They're not familiar with the command line. And so what I, what I initially did, did do was I got myself a bit of Google Cloud resource that's free, put all this stuff up on a uh, like password protected, but the password was pilage sort of thing, uh, so the uh, fellow academics could go and use it and it would run really nicely, whereas Bybinder doesn't really do that. So one of the things I would like is someone to give me some, a lot of time <laughs> to be able to advertise this and make it a cloud resource rather than having it be something you need to download and run on your laptop. Now the problem with that is that Malik Dynamics is actually quite a diff, it's quite a, a intensive code to run. Um, so like if I run on my laptop, the fan turns on to a level. Uh, and so that's a bit different. Okay, cool. Sick. And um, thank you very much. Yeah.